and we start with Anthony Kingsley. He's in London tonight, and he has a beautiful school in London that I had the pleasure to visit a few times, really enthusiastic. And I remember being there visiting while uh, his introduction to the Alexander book just came out. And it was fascinating how passionate the students were about it and how they were discussing the little things and they were literally popping it up and reading the little bit that they were talking about and still commenting in between them. So it was quite inspiring how people who were not writing were looking into this writing and using it to improve their training and to improve the way they communicated what they wanted to say about the technique. So that's a bit of the magic of Anthony, really. And that was one of the reasons I thought it would be really interesting to have him here. And the other reason is a bit about academic writing. If you had to write something, you may know that sometimes less is more. So if you have a lot of space, you can say whatever you want in whatever space you have. But learning to write and having to write in a limited amount of space, it's really hard. It can be harder. And so it can, be, it can be easier to say what you want in 5,000 words than in 500, or definitely is. So Anthony had a space limit, and I'm really curious about hearing about how he went with it. So the stage is yours, Anthony. Thank and you. thank you very much for making the time. Very happy to be here. And I see some familiar faces, which is really nice. Uh, Andrew, Alasny, and Jenny. And so it's nice to see some familiar faces I haven't seen for a while. And Ina and another Jenny, the other Jenny, Alessandra. Anyway, lovely to see you all. And um, I like the idea of changing this idea of um, social distance to personal distance because we're still socially engaged. We aren't socially distancing, we're socially connecting. And I think it's something we, we easily forget in this crazy world at the moment. We're not totally isolated, we socially connect. So socially distancing isn't totally accurate for me. So I'm happy to socially connect with you all across Zoom. Now, uh, why did I write the book? Well, a little bit of history. I didn't write the book, first of all. I'd love to have written the book, but Alexander wrote the book first. <laughs> and he didn't get my permission for it. So he wrote his book, but what happened was a few years ago, I got a call. I thought it was a hoax call, actually. And they said, um, Anthony Kingsley, I said, yes. They said, well, we'd like you to, um, would you be interested in writing the new introduction to Use of the Self? I thought someone's just taking the piss. So I said, yeah, who are you? And they said, oh, we're the publishing organization. And I said, how did you get hold of me? They said, oh, we were just checking on a few websites and we thought maybe you'd like to introduce something. And I said, well, what's the brief? And they said to me, well, the brief is, can you write something that potentially inspires a new generation of Alexander clients, pupils? I said, well, that's a tall order. I'll see what I can do. And um, I accepted. Uh, I wrote back saying, I accept. What's the brief? And they wrote back to me, saying, well, I've got a thousand words to write everything I want to write. I wrote back saying, don't accept, I want 6,000 words. <laughs> and we started an argy-bargy of how many words they'd give me. And we, they said they'll settle maximum on two and a half. And I kept on sending them edits and re-edits and re-edits. And we got it down to about four and a half, 4,000 or something more, more words. And they finally accepted it, but it caused a lot of editorial heartache along the way. And I must have done about uh, 30 edits. So the process of writing, as Rosella said, such a, a short, brief introduction to this book was a real challenge. I was very conscious that uh, the, the introduction to the use of the self beforehand was um, Dr. Barlow. And that was how I came into the Alexander Technique, having read Dr. Barlow's Alexander Principle. So for me, it felt like a full circle. I was really, really honored to, to write this introduction, but I also felt a huge sense of responsibility. I knew I was going to offend some people and probably inspire others. And I wasn't quite sure of the balance. And the other problem of writing 
was that I wasn't sure who the audience was going to be. And I had two audiences in mind. The first audience was people that have never heard of the Alexander Technique that will pick up the book and hopefully will, will be inspired to have lessons, to go to an Alexander teacher wherever they are. That was the first idea. And then I thought to myself, well, the use of the self isn't exactly the main book in town. It's not at every airport in boots or water stones. People aren't really gonna find the technique through just picking it off the shelf. I'd love it to be the case. It just isn't the case at the moment. And then I thought, well, who's the other audience? And the other audience, as we all know, are Alexander students and teachers who see the use of the self as a sort of Bible, a sort of a textbook and a description of how Alexander discovered the technique for himself. So that was the second audience, you guys. And so in, in the process of thinking about what to write, I was throwing out ideas in my class to my students daily, weekly, and for many months, and trying out my ideas, provoking them, getting feedback, having discussions. We went through the book, Use of the Self for our whole term. And I started getting some encouraging feedback and then sometimes some problematic feedback. And it all fed through into what I wanted to say. By the time I was ready to finalize my edit, I had come to a, a, an understanding, a realization that what I wanted to do was to reframe the Alexander Technique out of its familiar language of Victorian England, out of the Alexander jargon that I don't think inspires too many people, towards a language and a framing of the Alexander Technique as something, something that's relevant today to young people, to older people, that is relevant. And what is relevant today? Well, people are very excited about mindfulness. They're very excited about embodiment. They're very excited about body therapies. They're excited about human growth, stress management, impulse control emotional maturation, spiritual development. These are the things that interest people. And it's become very clear to me, both in training teachers that I've been doing for the last 30 odd years and in my individual practice, that this isn't the way we frame our work. We frame our work as a postural re-education and it certainly is a postural re-education. And it's for people, of course, with back problems and neck problems and so on. And the use of the self normally has a picture of a body on the front. Even the new edition has a picture of a person sitting in a chair. And we frame the technique as unconsciously or consciously how to sit nicely, how to walk nicely, how to improve movement. And yes, it is those things. It is those things. But my experience of Alexander, my personal experience, as well as my personal reading about the technique from Alexander and his four books, plus his articles and lectures, have convinced me that it is much, much, much more than that. And that we, in a way, sell ourselves short, that we don't really do justice to some of the most amazing things, amazing implications of the Alexander technique that is relevant and is so relevant to people today, if only we could reach them with a different language. Now I understand, and we ourselves, if we were meeting in real time and we're meeting in real time in real space, we could talk about inhibition and means whereby and directions and head forwards and up. We could talk about inhibition and end gaining and we'd all know what we talk about. And we could discuss and argue and debate, and that would be great. But my passion for writing the introduction was to go beyond that narrative, 
to go beyond that narrative and reach people. Number one, reach people who are not familiar with that language and wouldn't understand it and certainly wouldn't be inspired by that sort of language. But also, and maybe this was a bit of a pious hope, to talk to a, a new generation and maybe not so new generation of Alexander students and teachers that can be inspired to see their work in a way that is more all encompassing, is a wider perspective of what they actually are doing. And things like psychophysical unity, I, I, I still find it absolutely incredible that something like over a hundred years ago, Alexander was talking about the impossibility of separating mind from body. That every act is a mind body act. That we can't separate out the mind body. It is one organism. And that our mind bodies are a description of our psychophysical health and well-being. And that psychological stress and physiological stress is the same thing. And in the last 20 years, so much research is being carried out in neuroplasticity, in neuroscience, in psychosomatics, in psychobiology psycho neuroimmunology in fascinating fields that are just now confirming evidence-based the truths of the Alexander technique, which is psychophysical unity. Also my private practice has shown me that over so many years, I've been privileged to witness so many people that are, they come in and ostensibly with neck problems and back problems and RSI and rheumatic problems, aches, pains, illnesses. And as a result of the work they do, reveal psychological and emotional pain and trauma. In fact, it's, it's probably one of the best kept secrets that so many Alexander students and pupils come to Alexander with emotional pain that is somehow symptomized on the tapestry of the body. And maybe that's partly cultural where well, we can deal with the body. We release the neck and we open up and the muscles free up and spontaneously we recover. But clinically, and this is really what's important is that Alexander teacher, I know, I'm sure we know this. Sometimes emotional stuff comes up, fear comes up, memories come up, emotional truths come up and need to be held, supported, processed and potentially healed. And I was very clear, and I have been for a number of years, that the Alexander Technique isn't simply, isn't simply about sort out the postural distortions and neck, head and back problems. And that'll make you feel freer and lighter. And that can have a nice knock-on effect on the emotional body. But more than that, much, much, much more than that. And Alexander hinted at all of these things. He said, you're going to feel wrong. Faulty sensory appreciation. Force of habit. That is very, very difficult to shift. And my inspiration for writing this little introduction was to honor the psychophysical nature of symptoms. The psychophysical nature of all our symptoms, whether it's chronic illness, a lower backache, tendency for migraines, losing our voice, stomach ulcers, asthma, 
whatever the human functioning is being disturbed and distorted is often the result of a habitual way of being in the world, a habitual way of being in the world. If I constantly go around like a headless chicken, and we can call it end gaming if you like, rushing around and buzzing and stuff and over adrenalizing, that's going to overactivate my, activate my, my digestive system and lead to all sorts of digestive problems. My inability to quieten myself might lead to colitis, irritable bowel, the inability to sleep. It might lead to other inflammatory conditions because I'm always inflamed. The itises it might lead to many, many things. And for us to look at wellness and illness as being a psychophysical story, for me is really, really inspiring. Really inspiring. And I feel it's something that Alexander teachers can embrace fully because that's what we've been training in for three years. What do we train in? And I, you know, I, that's what I was writing about, the, the force of habit. What does it mean? Why do we have habits? What are these Alexander habits that Alexander was interested in? What's the genesis of these habits? They're not just posture habits that we work very hard as Alexander teaches to eradicate. What are these postural habits that hold us in their sway? Well, think about them. They're coping mechanisms and adaptations, very often to childhood wounds, pains and trauma. And they live in the mind and body and eventually cause trouble. It's one way of looking at things. Let's take, let's take Alexander's story as an example. He lost his voice. Well, that's a psychophysical story. You could say, oh no, it's not, it's just a bit of strain. He had to learn how to keep his neck free and just send his head forwards and up and, but it was much more than that. Think about the loss of voice as being Alexander's constant need to hold the audience because he was afraid of not holding the audience, of reaching out and end gaining so that he could be loved and accepted and successful. What do we all do when we don't feel loved? When we have to fight hard for our parents' love, say we're one of how many children? Six children, seven children, eight children, say we are. And mummy and daddy quite rightly are quite busy with all sorts of other demands. We have to fight for our place in the world. We have to fight for our bonding, our, our attachment, our critical attachment to mummy, daddy. So we develop ways of being seen. And we have a trauma of not being seen because that makes us feel terrified. So we become always, this is just one example, always having to cope with the fear and reality of not being seen and heard. So we reach out and try and grab mummy's daddy's attention until it becomes a habit. It's the way we are in the world because our earliest experiences set the stage for the future. So about by the time Alexander's a young man, he's in great need of wanting to hold on to people, reaching out, trying to sort of orally with his mouth and face hold on to people, making sure that he doesn't lose them. The idea of staying back and the audience either likes him or doesn't like him or people like him or don't like him was intolerable. So there's a force of habit, a force of habit that is much deeper than a silly way he learned to use his voice poorly because he didn't have the postural knowledge. But maybe it was indicating something so exciting about the human organism and its need early on in life to adapt and cope in a way to feel safe and secure or not overwhelmed by terror and then become and set the stage for psychophysical habits that lay the ground for future problems. 
And what if we've been traumatized? What if we've been unlucky to be traumatized by an abusive father or mother, alcoholic parents, absent parents? Neglect, abuse, what happens then? What happens then? What happens to the human organism? What happens to the human organism? What happens to the child at that time? And we've all had a variation of this, all of us. I certainly have. What does it do to the organism? I took this out of my kid's box the other day, box of tricks, and I took it, my little son, eight year old. He said, daddy, that's my toy. And I said, well, it's gonna be not mine for a while. <laughs> I've requisitioned it. And it's like, when we're little, everything's hopefully open and we pulsate, expand and contract. When a trauma comes along, we shut down, shut down. Not just one muscle, but as, human beings. We shut down, we become disembodied and we go into our various individualized habits. We don't let anything in. We don't want to feel. Most of the Alexander habits he was talking about are really strategies for not feeling, strategies for not coping, strategies for not being overwhelmed by intense emotional reality. So we cut off. One great way of cutting off is to live from here upwards. Does anyone know that one? I know that one very well. We live in the head upwards in the intellectual world of ideas and thoughts. For some of us, even spirituality up there. We fly off into our heads. We fly off into our heads, into feeling, into, into ideas. And what do we fly away from? Here downwards, the place of feeling, the place of emotional reality. Mind wandering. Today it's called ADD, ADHD. Anyone heard, heard of that one? It's epidemic now, epidemic. Everyone's tagged, labeled as ADHD, autistic, Asperger's, attention deficit. Alexander called it mind wandering. Why would, a, why would a child mind wander? Alexander talked about the habit of mind wandering. Well, it's not stupidity. It's not that you don't know where your neck should be or should or do know where your neck should be or your head should be. It's a desire to flee away from the presence, from the embodied presence, to wander away and to tell a little kid, just stop mind wandering, pay attention, is not the answer. And over the years, and I have done a psychotherapy training and that's another story. And I have done my own analysis for 10 years, three times a week, lying on a couch. And even that's not enough, I'm still screwed up. But it's a start, it's just a beginning. I realized that the whole of the Alexander technique is a way to come back to the body, a way of being re-embodied, to recover, to re-embody, re-experience, ourselves as vital and alive human beings that need to remember and cope with the reality of our psychophysical selves. But we can only do this when we're safe. And the Alexander teacher provides that safety through having spent three years on learning to stay back from their own dramas. You may not realize it, all of you, I hope you do, that three years of Alexander training is three years of learning how to cope with your own emotional realities, your own reactions to stimuli, so that you don't get overly caught up in your, in your own drama, so that that can heal, and so that you can sit there with another person. Because if you can't sit there with another human being, you can't be an Alexander teacher. You'll be reacting to them. They will trigger you. The whole, the whole purpose of Alexander is about triggering. 
what Alexander called reactions to stimuli. We're triggered by stuff. Someone says something that's not pleasant, we get triggered and we go into our particular familiar habitual pathways. And the, the technique is a way of desensitizing the trigger so that you can come home and return to your embodied reality. And that's painful. It's painful when you recover. It's painful coming out of deep freeze. It's painful coming out of deep shock. It's painful when frostbite warms up. It's painful to re return home. And I really want to offer in this book an opportunity to say, look, this work is not just a Pollyanna and a picnic of feel goodness, of nice movement and nice flow with everyone going around with a nice smile. But actually, it, the depth of the work is potential for healing. Deep healing, depth healing, psychophysically. And that actually going back, recovering ourselves, re-embodying ourselves, remembering ourselves, our organs, our feelings, our sensations, coming back to our authentic selves is a journey that's worth doing. It's a journey that's worth doing. And that is the Alexander technique in the way I see it. And it was the potential for depth, psychophysical healing that inspired me all those years ago and inspires me today. And I want to reach out to students and teachers and newcomers and say, the Alexander Technique can offer a safe space where we can begin to heal our fractured souls. And yes, there can be postural and movement benefits. But since we all struggle in our different ways, since we all struggle and we all have our psychological stories, I feel that this is a potential that hasn't quite reached the world. And I do believe it was a potential that Alexander saw, but perhaps didn't have the language for. And I, as I suggest, quoting from one of my favorite teachers, Leonard Cohen, there is a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. There is a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. And for me, that's another description of what we do. We let the light into the cracks. And bit by bit, we can become more whole and less fractured in touch with our sorrows and pains, our hopes and disappointments, our joy and our pleasure, all of it. Because returning to our embodied selves is life. And being cut off from our embodied selves is living less fully. And so the way I understand Alexander's symptoms, neck problems, back problems, chronic illnesses, is that they can be symptoms of self-estrangement, of alienation from who, who we are and who we were designed to be, our real selves, our authentic selves. And we can offer a a support and be a compassionate witness, a compassionate witness for those that want to undertake the most important journey of all, which is a return, a return back home. Okay. Thank you. So I'm, I'm available for relating more deeply to certain questions. I've got Kay, and then okay. I've got Alasne. I just wanted to say, where can we get your the new edition, Anthony, with you your forward? 
Oh, oh, this one, this is just Amazon, I think, but you have to, uh, there's still the old edition on Amazon. So I think you'll have to click on the link. I can send you the link or send it via Rosella because yeah, okay. uh, there's okay. lots of editions you can buy on Amazon. If you want this particular one, I think you have to click a certain category. Thank you. Yeah. I'm happy to say that actually, if you Google that, that book on um, Amazon UK, the new one comes up, of course, because that's Amazon okay. always tries to sell the new edition. So that's mm -hmm. the easy one to find in a certain way. Okay, I'll ask Ness. Yeah, so I was just telling Anthony that um, thank you for the talk and that, that was my experience that I came to the Alexander Technique with huge physical pain, but then it turned out it was coming from huge, deeper emotional pain. And the Alexander Technique gave me, you know, that space, protected space to release, to cry, to, you know, not being judgmental, everything. And then, you know, I could even start breathing better and, and get rid of the physical pain. But uh, I had like uh, two main teachers and one of them, you know, was allowing this emotional and, and talking and, and, and the other one was more about doing the... Alexander technique itself, and they were they both work for me very well. But uh, and but she was saying we shouldn't be talking, you know, as psychotherapists. That I know Anthony is a psychotherapist, so he has that. But they 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 study a lot for this. But uh, uh, so what should we do? You know, like I, I am a bit debated. You know, I I am not psychotherapist. I have a business background and then exercise and so. But, uh, but in myself, I know that the Alexander Technique works as an emotional uh, uh, tool. So um, yes. I, don't, I don't know how, I mean, can we, can't we, you know? Can yes. uh, well, first of all, I think that's a very important point that I wouldn't want anybody who's an Alexander teacher to play with the emotional realm and to pretend or act like a psychotherapist and start digging into a person's background, inquiring about narratives. What I am saying is that, and as in your experience, stuff will come up whether you like it or not. Stuff will come up. Wounds will come up. Not simply nice releases and it's all done and dusted. But if you provide a safe space and you're staying back and you're able to maintain your psychophysical condition of non-reaction that provides a ground where your pupil can start to allow more experience to their being and that's just a function of who you are at that time it's not because you're digging or playing psychotherapy it's because as a human being you're providing a fertile ground where a person can come back to their bodies and back to their experience. And to deny that this is part of the Alexander journey is crazy. And it's not going to totally, simply- yeah, I yeah. totally agree that the safe space gave me the, the, the path. Yes. And, um, and when, when that, that happens, it's really important that all of you know the territory. And what do I mean by know the territory? I mean, know the territory first and foremost in your own psychological and emotional and physical evolution that you've journeyed towards your own emotional truth that you've made the journey from disembodied out of bodied habitual patterns of distortion and diversion back home and to spend three years on a psychophysical journey will have given you a certain experience and an understanding. And if you've been allowed to, to, to name the beast, to name your truth as you go through your journey, that your physical pain may be a manifestation of emotional pain, then after a period of training, you are there, therefore more equipped to hold that space for someone else who goes through it without delving and pretending that you can diagnose or analyze or auto-suggest, none of that. 
The role of a good Alexander teacher is to be a good Alexander teacher. But when I say a good Alexander teacher, that means a teacher who can honor the whole psychophysical spectrum of experience and not one segment called the postural and muscular segment, but the whole tapestry of being human. And so the further you go in your own journey, and this is just a, a truth, the further you go in your own journey and visit your own dark nights of your soul, the more you touch your own terrors and fears and anxieties and pains, the more you travel through and process to a certain degree your wounds and open up to your emotional truths, you will embody that essential safety that provides the ground for holding someone else's experience without mentioning it. You don't say, oh, trust me, come and trust me, I'm the emotional guru. Mm -hmm. Your being, your essence, who you are, your use of self, that's what Alexander meant by use of self, the way that you are in life, the way that you emanate your energy in being with another human being your ability to listen, not with effort and doing, but non-doing, non-doing listening, non-doing hands, non-doing understanding, non-doing analysis. You don't do any, anything at all. It emanates from you because that's just who you are. You don't do psychotherapy. You are who you are because you've journeyed towards a closer version of your true self. And that space, that space that you inhabit more so after a number of years of Alexander is the fertile ground that supports another human being to come closer to their own selves. And that's not psychotherapy, it's psychotherapeutic, but it's actually Alexander at core. I thought about a word for this the other day. I, I was trying to think of something because I knew I would be asked this. Someone might say, it's not real Alexander, you're going off into psychotherapy. And I thought, well, no, I, this is an approach to Alexander for me that widens the umbrella. And I, I was thinking of what I can call this. And I thought to myself, maybe we should just call this depth Alexander practice, depth Alexander practice, maybe something that, that honors that this isn't a deviation outside of Alexander into some realm of psychotherapy, but it is Alexander. But when we can allow ourselves to go deeper and hold that space for the potential for healing. Anthony, a, uh, yes, yes, yes. I got two questions for you came by email. Oh. Sorry. One is, uh, when are you going to write your own book? Uh. There is four exclamation marks. <laughs> So it's not a question. And the other one was, uh, what do you do if someone starts to cry on your table? Um, well, I'd wipe the table down first. You know, that's the first thing. Uh, uh, okay, second question first. What do I do if someone cries on the table? I would hopefully, through who I am at that moment, give them full permission to feel sad and cry. And I wouldn't say, why are you crying? And when did it begin? And analyze it but hopefully allow them. And I'll probably reflect and say, some sadness is coming up. That's, uh, that's, that, that's, that's fine, that's good. Some sadness is coming up and to help them, allow them to feel safe that they can cry in my presence. That crying is okay. They can feel angry, they can cry, they can have a memory that's frightening. And for me to provide a space, a safe space where a memory, an association, a tear, a feeling of anger and resentment, a sensation can come up. And maybe that it can keep on coming up, that actually I can get reacquainted and that sad is okay and I don't have to hold on to, sad isn't okay, I mustn't show sad because if I show sad, people will reject me. People will not like me. If I cry, I cry alone. Has anyone heard of that ridiculous English version? If you laugh, everyone laughs with you. If you cry, you cry alone. I mean, goodness, what idiots. But you know, that's English culture. 
cry, you cry alone. Cry, you lose the Cry, you're not welcome. Cry, unacceptable, unlovable. So I want people when they cry, if they cry, to not get that message. And I can only allow that if I've given that message to myself deeply. Yeah. The first is, when will I write a book? <laughs> My main passion at the, at the moment is one-to-one -one work and training teachers and raising kids. <laughs> so um, as soon as I have a bit more space, I am working on a book, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know when it will see the light of day. Wow. Okay, I'm gonna say thank you to Anthony. I think we all a bit, uh, um, I don't know the word in English, but when you deeply listen to something and you have to need time to process it, I feel a bit like that. Can I give one, a, a bit of a practical idea for everybody? Sure. That when often we think of forward and up, we often think of you know the head going forwards and up. Mm -hmm. I think what we've talked about a lot today is the possibility of coming down and back that we can actually come down and back into ourselves where we can get reintroduced to the place where it hurts and the place where it's alive and the place where we feel and the place that's home. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Really cool. lovely to hear you speak. Great. Bye-bye. Thank you, Anthony. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Bye-bye. Thank you.